everyone, I am Kamalika Bose and uh, in this inescapable lockdown today, I will try um, and attempt to bring the outdoors in by uh, trying to revisit and understand some of the edifices that we love so much and many of which lend Bombay its world heritage uh, credence an ensemble of diverse architectural styles uh, which were used essentially as a political expression to consolidate the colonial project in uh, Bombay. So uh, to begin with, uh, right back to the 17th century when the East India Company, as part of the East India Company territories, the presidency town of Bombay, along with Calcutta and Madras became company towns where the fort uh, became the epicenter to primarily fulfill governance and trade mandates of the company. And hence, uh, Fort George in uh, Bombay was established and gives us the first sort of glimpse to uh, utilitarian architecture of uh, the early 18th century, where the only piece of uh, embellished um, architecture that we see was the first Anglican church, the St. Thomas uh, Church, um, built in 1718, which was surrounded by utilitarian buildings such as hospitals, uh, court of justice, and other key civic um, amenities around the fort. But from there on, we begin um, to see um, an expansion of ambition, moving from company to harboring aspirations for empire. And in the mid 18th century, uh, really after the Battle of uh, Plassey in 1757, we uh, see that this expansion and this ambition of empire and the imperial agenda across the Indian subcontinent. And using uh, architecture once again as a political expression, uh, the use of the neoclassical style or the classical revivalism as we know it, uh, became the chosen uh, architectural device or tool or style uh, to unify uh, the, uh, the empire such as Calcutta, Madras, uh, Bombay and uh, today that old town hall of the Asiatic society remains emblematic of this phase of um, architecture along with many of the early buildings along uh, Rampart Road. However, moving on to the late uh, 19th century, we begin to see the uh, response to the industrial age, to the industrial revolution, the age of manufacturing new building materials, transportation, and the advent of the railway and the railroad uh, system, which leads to a rapid urban renewal of cities. And that's also when the uh, governor of Bombay Bartle Freuer uh, begins to sow a new imagination of Bombay as the herbs primus in Indus and uh, sows a new idea of the city by removing uh, the fort walls and it's in 1864 that we see the birth of a new architectural paradigm where the neoclassical city now makes way for the neo-gothic city uh, leading to uh, the gothic revival um, style it also defines a new sort of um, urbanism where large swaths of land were cleared out to create a uh, new public buildings, new infrastructure, new railway stations. Uh, and of course, while uh, the VT station, uh, the CST station today, and the Bombay Municipal Corporation building are really the jewel in the crown of maybe this style, the style truly uh, became the ornament of the esplanade and displaying a rich variety and diversity of building types, building styles, and architectural elements and uh, Neo-Gothic or Bombay Gothic as it's known is has also made it to uh, the World Heritage uh, list of uh, Bombay's um, ensemble today. But however, uh, as we move into the 20th century, we begin to see the Raj with a new agenda of wanting to orientalize itself in a certain way. Uh, the British now kind of begin to see themselves as the new Mughals, uh, almost with believing that the empire was here to stay. And uh, 
and we see that because, uh, through the shift of the capital from Calcutta to Delhi through large scale mega events like the Delhi Darbar in 1911, they begin to document Indian traditional architecture such as the Jaipur portfolio in 1890. So there's this and of course the creation of Latians uh, Delhi as well and the birth of the new Indo-Saracenic style. So we also begin to see uh, several buildings in the Fort Precinct now built in uh, the Indo-Saracenic style. Of course, uh, the Prince of Wales Museum the, uh, became the, again a, a landmark of, of that style. Uh, and several other public institutions as well, such as the uh, General Post Office and of course the Gateway of India. But however, uh, in the 20th century, as the British power began to wean and it was evident that India is moving towards embracing a new modernity and embracing independence eventually, we begin to see uh, a new sort of uh, modernism coming into Bombay uh, through the Art Deco. So we are now looking at more streamlined uh, elements of the ocean liner of uh, a style which has been adopted across Miami and uh, America and a new sort of skyline emerges uh, along uh, Marine Drive. And today when we look at Bombay, we kind of look at this uh, coexistence, this sort of harmonious uh, presence of all these various slices and times um, in, in history and uh, of course uh, this gives us an understanding of the political intention and how architecture was used as a tool and, and, and today it's our sort of collective shared heritage that we have inherited, a legacy that we, um, it, it, which is our responsibility to take forward and uh, places like DN Road, the Regal Circle uh, pretty much give us in, in a nutshell um, a co the coexistence of all of these various styles. So uh, this is a vast topic and um, this attempt to, uh, to give it to you in a nutshell really is a huge uh, challenge but I'm going to encourage you all to also read uh, on this online. Uh, there are some very interesting articles on Live History India as well as uh, blog posts on Bombay's uh, architectural legacy as well as books such as uh, The Indian Metropolis by Norma Evanson which are huge repositories on this subject. Thank you.